Finally, the show you've all been waiting for, Professor Tim Noakes is here. Professor Tim Noakes is a respected South African sports scientist who has been championing a high-fat, moderate protein diet as an effective solution to pre-diabetes, a lifestyle disease he himself was diagnosed with a few years ago. The new eating plan he embarked on, which entails eating protein and a high-fat food and avoiding carbs. Notes is incredibly pragmatic and charismatic to boot, and it's hard not to be swayed by what he has to say in his new book, The Real Meal Revolution. He's quick to add though that the eating plan he's championing is not a short-term diet or a quick fix for that matter. It's a complete lifestyle change which means changing your attitude towards food, drink and exercise. Professor, welcome to the program. Thanks, Faisal. Now, I've had numerous requests over the last months to have you on the show. Uh, there's many people walking all over the continent <laughs> that is amazed by some of the work that you do, and there's those that don't agree with what you do. Sure. Where did it all start? Well, personally, I've, I started running many years ago, and I took in the old idea that you must eat lots of carbohydrates. And I wrote a book called Law of Running, which became very, very popular. And there it says you must eat lots of carbohydrate for health and performance. And four years ago, I suddenly realized that that was not the case. By chance, I discovered that there was a whole body of evidence showing that low carbohydrate diets were particularly healthy for people like myself who are insulin resistant. I changed and my life changed completely. I basically went back 20 years in terms of my health and my physical ability and my running ability. I went back to 40, from 60 to 40. And then I started reading and I didn't say much for about a year or two. And then we wrote this book and then it became public knowledge that I changed. And I had then had to defend myself. And I'm very happy now that I've read all the literature and it's very clear that we're onto something. There's a world out here that, that's looking at Professor Tim Noakes and your research and what you are doing. And there's a complete polarity in that yeah. from the point of view that the one half is saying it's working for me, it's doing exceptionally well, and the other half is saying He's speaking at the rubbish and that, that's what's happening. I've been looking sure. at the reviews and that sort of thing. In the end of the day, I take it that you're an expert at what you do and you've come up with something that says um, low carbs, high fat and um, high protein. How do you come to that determination and why? Because it's going against the grain, if I may use that word, yeah. of well, what people understand to be weight loss. Well, we, we've been eating this way right through to the 1950s and then a guy called Ansel Keys in the United States came along and said heart disease is caused by high fat diets. There was no evidence for that and there still is no evidence. And today on, today on Sky News it said that, that we should never have gone down this route. So the evidence is very clear that he was wrong. Unfortunately, once he, that idea became came public, industry got involved and they started producing high sugar, low fat diets and foods and that's what's been killing us and it takes time for you to realize the science is bogus now i'm i'm a diet in the world scientist i have three doctorate degrees and i look then at what is good science and what is bad science and bad science is what we call associational studies where they look at a population and 30 years ago they see what they were eating and then they work out what they died from and they try to link that back to their diets now that is just terrible science because the only way you'll pick out something is if it is an exclusive cause, like cigarettes and cancer of the lung. That's an exclusive cause. And then you can pick it up by that sort of study. But people do many things. They don't just eat carbohydrates or fat. They either exercise or they don't. They drink alcohol. They're religious or not. They go to church or whatever. And those things all impact on their lives. And you can't just come along and say it was the diet. And so the predictive value of these is so low that in the 1930s and 40s and 50s when people started looking at medical statistics they said only if the value that we look for is a value of two or greater can you say that there might be a relationship we're dealing with figures of 1.15 which is complete garbage and tragically it comes from one harvard medical school who've made a, a business of these associational studies and they, they really are the scaremongers. 
whenever you see, oh, meat's bad for you, or saturated fat, or cheese, or butter's bad for you, it comes from that bad science from, from these universities who should know better. Correct. Yes. When you mention the word term notes or the name term notes, people normally talk about banting, but you're okay with the term banting, but you say it's not entirely banting. <laughs> uh, if you can clear that one up yeah. for us. We use the word banting to make people realize that in 1862, this diet was first described by a chap called William Banting. Who was an undertaker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who lost weight after trying to do everything. And he wrote a book. And of course, it was rejected by the medical profession. But, but then, and even the profession forced him or the person who described the diet to change it and say it wasn't actually low carbohydrate, it was high protein, and it wasn't. It was a high fat diet. And then a guy, Wilhelm Epstein from Germany, wrote the next one, 1884, and he wrote the definitive text on this diet. And so, therefore, it is the first diet for the control of obesity and diabetes. It is the first diet. Therefore, any other diet is a fat. So the diet that you're told, or we're told, the high carbohydrate diets for weight loss are fad diets. And we're not told that because the people who are giving us nutrition advice don't understand that nutrition began three million years ago. It didn't begin in 1977 when the US government came along and said we must eat more carbohydrate. Now you were predisposed with uh, diabetes, type yeah. 2 diabetes yourself, and that's passed through the family and that sort of thing. And you say that after four years of being on your own diet, you are sleeping better. Your wife, Madeline, I think, is, yes. um, is feeling much better because you're not snoring anymore. Mm. Um, you've got a whole lot of lifestyle changes that's happened since you've been on your own diet. And you talk a lot about diabetes and diabetics, and your focus seems to be there. Am I correct to say that your focus is diabetics? Well, it's actually this condition of insulin resistance. Now, Insulin resistance is the single most important medical condition around the globe. We know that 50% of Americans already are diagnosed with insulin resistance, but we don't even teach it in our medical schools. We just ignore it as if it doesn't exist. So if you're insulin resistant, you can't metabolize carbohydrates. And as soon as you eat more than about 100 grams of carbohydrate a day, your body struggles and it converts that carbohydrate into fat. It's the only way it can store it. And you store it and you store the fat in your liver and that causes all secondary consequences. And you always over-secrete insulin to try and get this carbohydrate out of the system. And the insulin then produces a whole bunch of problems. So it's that combination of the insulin resistance and excessive insulin production that then causes a range of diseases. It causes particularly diabetes, obesity. We think dementia and cancer, although I'm not going to say it absolutely. I think the evidence is still to come. And the only way, and all you need to do is just don't eat carbohydrate and you will live a perfectly healthy life. And that's all we have to tell our patients. And instead we don't. We say, Noakes is mad, keep eating the carbohydrates. Why? Because Ansel Keys said that in 1957 to prevent heart disease. But heart disease is not the disease that's a problem in the Western Cape and in the world. It's diabetes. And we've got to address diabetes. So what happens? We just ignore it. And we've, we've allowed the cardiologists to take center stage and say, you cannot eat fat, you cannot follow what Dr. Noakes says, because you're all going to die of heart disease. And that is wrong, because there's no evidence for that. Now, looking at the situation of some of our viewers that might not be diabetics at all, yeah. the general person sitting and watching the show right now is concerned about how do I not pick up weight, and how do I lose fat if I've got <laughs> too much weight? What's your advice around that? Because that's a critical question with people sitting at home right now. They worry about that more yeah. than anything else. Yeah, so. What you have to understand is that if you have a roll of fat around your tummy, that is called your insulin roll. And so you pick it up like this and you say, good morning, insulin roll. <laughs> and then you're slowly, finally getting to understand that insulin drives the carbohydrate in our diet to fat. And we store it as fat. And it locks it up in that fat cell. And as long as you're eating carbohydrate, your insulin levels are always high. And they take the carbohydrate from your diet and just deposit it as fat. And you can't burn it. And that's the key. So as long as you understand insulin is the fat building hormone. And right. you know, I see all these articles, oh, you must keep leptin low and this and that. It is, it's insulin. And insulin is driven by carbohydrate. So the key is if you understand that, how do you keep your insulin down? By reducing your carbohydrate intake and increasing your fat. So fat is what makes you thin, whereas carbohydrate makes you fat. It's a very profound statement, fat 
is something that makes you thin. And I suppose that's the problem that people have yeah. with you yeah. and your research and, and your determinations. Because throughout the years, when people spoke about eating fatty foods, it would mean that you are going to get fat. And you are saying that that's not the truth. That's absolutely wrong. You know, I grew up in the 1960s and everyone was lean in those days because we hadn't got this rubbish idea that you had to eat industrial carbohydrate rich foods. And when I look around today, it's quite different. So I go and speak at schools and I remember when I was at school, we all looked like me, we were all lean. And now it's, it's shocking. And particularly the young girls, I really feel sorry for them. <laughs> and they don't understand what's causing it. It's simple. Too much carbohydrate in people who are probably insulin resistant. So if you're insulin resistant, all you do is cut the carbohydrates and you will be lean again. It is so simple. It sounds really simple. Um, I must admit that I picked up something else that I found interesting on your side and that was that you spoke about fruit and um, the intake should not be that high or not at all. I'm not sure yeah. if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, the idea that you must have five fruit and veg a day is also industry driven. Most of these guidelines are industry driven. There is no evidence that a particular amount. We do know from long term trials, yes, vegetables and fruit, particularly vegetables, vegetables clearly do have some beneficial role and they do provide nutrients that you can get in other sources, but they're probably very good for you in, fruit, in, in vegetables. The problem with fruit is it has a high carbohydrate load. And when you've got diabetes, you may not have more than 25 grams of carbohydrate a day. And 25 grams is one apple. So if you're diabetic and you're told to eat an apple a day, you're killing yourself. And that's, that's the reality. So are you saying that the old saying of an apple a day keeps the doctor away is really not true at all? It's not true at all. You do much better to I can to see eat. why people are fighting with you, I yeah, must admit. Exactly. Well, I could imagine the industries. <laughs> but if you were to eat kale uh, and other vegetables, other leafy vegetables, Absolutely, they're going to keep the doctor away. Dr. Getting, getting down to the practical and pragmatic yeah. approach, when you look at, let's say, Monday afternoon, I need to have supper. What is a good supper? You're talking about protein, you're talking about high fat, and you're talking no, no carbs at all. So give me an idea of a good supper. Lots of vegetables mm -hmm. and meat or fish or pork, if you can have it, all those things. Any, those are all you need. So it, it's remarkable how little you have to eat. And, and the, key, the key driver of obesity is hunger. So everyone who's fat has one characteristic, they're always hungry. And I was always hungry when I was fat, and I'm never hungry now. The difference is I eat lots of fat. And that then turns off my drive to be hungry. So you say the fat turns off the drive, That's because right. we were also led to believe that if you're having some sugar, like a chocolate bar or something like that, um, you'd no longer feel hungry at all. That's absolute nonsense. What that does is it, it produces addic addictive eating. So most really obese people have a sugar addiction as well. And food is designed, the industrial food that we eat is designed to make sure you want to eat in three hours time. And that's the key. So carbohydrates drive the brain to make you hungry. They do not satiate you. So you're always overeating. And that's why this diet, it's remarkable how little people eat because they cut out the carbohydrates which are driving the carbohydrate consumption. And then you probably eat pretty much what you did before, but you just cut out the rubbish carbohydrates as well. But there are some other lifestyle changes that you'd prescribe along with that. Yeah. Um, that's exercise and those kind of things. How does that fit into what, what the diet is saying? Yeah, the, the reality... Are you not short of energy? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. No, you're short of energy if you're eating high carbohydrates, high sugar diets. That's the key. Everyone will tell you. The energy level just goes through the roof as soon as you get on the start. That's odd because many years ago we, we grew up with these ads on TV that says that sugar gives you life and sugar gives you go and all those kind of things. So you are obviously opposing all of that at this stage also. Yeah, well that's good marketing and that's the brainwashing we've had over the years. And um, you, you have to understand the sugar industry is the one industry you probably wouldn't want to be in at the moment because this whole move is to cut sugar. And there's a whole bunch of movies coming out in the next year or so which address the problems of, of excessive sugar consumption. What's your thoughts on soda drinks, the gas drinks and those kind of things? Uh, are they a major contributory factor to picking up weight? Absolutely, because it's just, sugar, it's just a sugar rush and you get hungry and you'll eat, drink more and it's highly addictive. So we have to understand that for some of us sugar is highly addictive and the simple test if you can eat a single block of chocolate, you don't have a sugar addiction. If you can't, if you have to eat the whole, the whole slab of chocolate, you have a sugar addiction. And your only hope is you may never touch sugar at all. 
The beauty of moving onto this diet is you remove the de desire for sugar and sweetness completely and you replace it with a hunger for fat and then you're fine. But, and I think that's the problem. What we did was we took fat out the diet, we replaced it with sugar which made us addicted. And I think the less fat you have in the diet, the more likely it is you're going to have the sugar addiction. I'm sitting and I'm thinking all the time, I would want to make this change. How, how am I going to do that? That's an important thing. We're going to go back to a break. Dr. Tim Notes. When we come back, we'll discuss The Real Meal Revolution, the book by Dr. Tim Notes, and how that could perhaps change your life. <laughs> 